Hi guys, how's it going tonight? So I did have a video that I was going to share with everybody tonight, but with all of the other extra festivities that we had with the time of year and No Shave November and all that, we're going to skip it, but I'll throw it out there. If you guys want to go to BibleProject.com, they make really cool videos that explain the books of the Bible. And I was going to show you the book of 1 Corinthians to kind of lead up to where we're at and then show where we're going to continue to go to in next semester. So you can find those on YouTube. They're really, really cool videos, but wanted to skip it tonight. Um, but before we get into our passage tonight, I want to ask you guys a question. Have you ever given up something that was yours for the benefit of someone else? Maybe even like sharing as a little kid, right? It's one of the first things you learn, giving up something for the benefit of somebody else. Um, now, I was, a, I was a very entrepreneurial little kid. Um, young Nathaniel was always trying to wheel and deal and try to find uh, any way he could to make money. I did everything from raking leaves out of people's yards I uh, developed little carnivals with tickets and prizes, and I charged the neighborhood kids to play them, and they'd, you know, pay for the prizes, and of course I made a profit. Um, I even uh, made a newspaper that I went out and sold door-to-door to all of our neighbors for 10 cents a copy. Unfortunately, it only had two publications, but I did make some money. Um, one of my more lucrative uh, ventures that I had as a child was a lemonade stand, um, and I had that lemonade stand on the busiest street. And uh, I remember specifically one of the times when I specifically raked in the dough, I made like 50 or $60, and that's a lot of money for a seven-year-old, especially from a lemonade stand. Um, and so I, I, you can bet I had lots of plans for that money. I knew what I was going to do. I was probably going to buy a bunch of baseball cards. I love baseball cards. Um, but I went to Sunday school the, the next day, and, and our teacher brought in uh, these pamphlets, and, uh, and she showed us that, that, you could, that we could buy um, chickens and goats and other things like that for um, less fortunate Christians in other countries. And, uh, and she, you know, she explained how these chickens and goats would, would not only feed their families, but other families in the community, and it could help them uh, you know, have something to uh, have an income on and help their community. Um, and, and, and I, as, as a seven-year-old, I, I decided, you know what, I, I went home and I, I grabbed all my money from the lemonade stand, and I decided to bring it back the next Sunday to contribute towards, I think, buying one goat. I think we all pulled together and bought one goat. Um, but that was like one really big, cool thing that we did as a Sunday school class. Now, I'm not telling this story to show how uh, righteous I was as a seven-year-old. I still was mean to my sisters sometimes, disobeyed my parents, probably stuck my tongue out at people that I didn't like. Um, but I bring this up to, to communicate the overarching principle of the passage that we have tonight in conjunction with the past couple chapters as well. And it's this, love compels us to lay down our rights. Love compels us to lay down our rights. So it's very similar to what uh, Chris talked about in chapter 8 last week. And so in our passage tonight, we'll see that within the context of Paul's asking the Corinthians to give up their rights to eat temple meat, um, Paul is is, is now moving forward into, uh, into another example where he talks about how he gives up a right for the benefit of the body of Christ. Um, but Paul will also use this occasion to defend his apostolic authority a little bit as well. And so let's go ahead and jump into our passage, and it is on the U version tonight for any of you guys who, who are using that. Um, but 1 Corinthians chapter 9 will be in verses 1 through 18. So our first section is Paul's rights as an apostle and a minister of the gospel. So we'll go ahead and go through the verses here, and we'll talk about them as we go. Verse 1 says, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are not you my workmanship in the Lord? So Paul starts off with a series of, of, of four different questions, and all four of these questions are, are, are kind of incredulous questions. As, as you guys know, you've seen through Romans last year and 1 Corinthians now, Paul likes to ask these questions, kind of like, am I wearing uh, a flannel shirt? It's like, yes, I am wearing a flannel shirt. It's an obvious answer. So he's saying the answer by asking the question. Um, and so he, he asks these four things. And he begs these questions uh, to, to develop his, his authority as an ap- apostolic uh, leader of the church. Um, now, of course, in, in 2 Corinthians, almost the entire second half of the book, for those of you who have read it, um, is Paul's defense of his apostolic authority. And so we see that it was a problem with the Corinthians. They, they had a lack of trust in Paul. Um, they kind of saw Paul as, as a weaker man. Um, he wasn't very specifically gifted in his oratory skills. Um, and they just, they weren't overall impressed with him. The Corinthians were very, uh, very much about the appearances and kind of the, the carrying yourself and the way that you did and said things. And they just weren't impressed with Paul. And so we kind of see the beginnings of Paul addressing this uh, lack of trust in his authority as an apostle apostle right here. 
And so he says, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are not you my workmanship in the Lord? And so Paul is laying the groundwork here to uh, talk about a right that he has given up, and even he, not just as a normal Christian, but somebody who is free, an apostle, who has seen the Lord Jesus, and is the spiritual father of the Corinthian church. And so even he, as all of these things, apostolic authority, Paul, at times denies himself of some spiritual freedoms. In verse 2, it says, If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. So basically what Paul's saying here is, is even if nobody else looked at him as an apostle, of all people, the Corinthians should, because he is their spiritual father. He is the one that has poured into them, brought them the gospel, and helped them grow. Verse 3 says, This is my defense to those who would examine me. Um, now, the way, the, the, the way Paul brings this up in verse 3, it kind of sounds like he's saying, this is my defense to those who would examine me, and now I'm going to tell you those things. But really, he's just saying what he said previously is his defense to those who would examine him. So anybody who would examine him saying, uh, do you actually have apostolic authority? He would point to these four things. He's free. He is an apostle. He has seen the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. And then he is the spiritual father of the Corinthian church. So Paul moves on in verse 4. He says, Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? So in verses 4, 5, and 6, Paul brings up three different things that he has a right to do as an apostle and as an, a minister of the gospel. Um, eat and drink and bring along a believing wife on his missionary journeys and, and expectedly a family as well, and to then earn a living through preaching. Um, now, all of these things should be understood uh, within the context of kind of at the church's dime, essentially, is what he's saying. He has a right to these things, just as um, the other apostles in verse 5, the brothers of Jesus, and Peter, also known as Cephas. Um, and so, after all, no one, no one would have questioned an apostle or a minister of the gospel having a wife in that time period, um, but a church may have questioned an apostle bringing along a believing wife and family um, on his missionary journeys because it would have just made the cost of that missionary journey a little bit more expensive, right? Um, but he's stating that this is a right, and this is a right that the other apostles have exercised as well. Verse 7, Paul brings up three different examples um, that, that they would have seen in everyday life of people who essentially uh, get a living from the work that they do. And so he says in verse 7, Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Um, so what Paul is doing here with these three different examples is he's kind of drawing from three uh, separate kind of uh, classes of society, if you will. Um, a soldier would have been pretty highly respected. Um, he says that, you know, a soldier gets paid by the work that he does. Um, a vineyard worker would have been maybe kind of just an average laborer. And so he says they also share in the fruit of their labor. They share in the grapes, right? They take some home. Maybe they sell some at the marketplace. Either way, they're paid through what they're doing. Um, and then even the shepherd, which back in this day, a lot of shepherds were actually slaves. Um, and, and as we know, you know, you've, you, we're getting close to Christmas. We're going to hear talk about the shepherds, seeing the angels. Um, they were the lowest of the low in society. And so the shepherds, who may have even been slaves, also get some of the milk. And so what Paul is communicating here is that, that all, even as basic as it is, is sharing in the profits of what um, each person is working towards. Then in verses 8 through 10, Paul says, Do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same? For it is, not written in, is it not written in the law of Moses, You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain? Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Does he not certainly speak for our sake? It was written for our sake, because the plowman should plow in hope, and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing the crop. So Paul says... Uh, I'm not just saying these things on, on human authority. He's saying this is, this is a concept based on even God's, uh, God's word as well. And so Paul quotes a passage from Deuteronomy uh, stating that it is part of God's design for a worker to share in the fruits of the harvest um, or share in the profits of what they are working towards, even down to the animals, right? In Deuteronomy, don't muzzle the ox while it treads the grain. And so what Paul is saying here is he's saying that, that though this, is, this principle that is given in Deuteronomy was not only only just a literal thing. Uh, the, the Israelites, make no mistake, this wasn't just a metaphor that God gave to communicate something else. Um, they actually weren't supposed to muzzle the ox while it, fed, while it treaded the grain. Um, it was allowed to eat as it was working. And so Paul is basically saying that this also communicates a, a characteristic of God and a principle of God 
in the sense that, that God wants people to be able to, to share in the work of their harvest. And so what Paul is saying here is that, that if this applies for even the animals, how much more does this apply to people as well, and, and apostles and ministers as well? Then in verses 11 through 12, Paul says, If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, do not we even more? And so here is where Paul kind of gets to his main point here, saying that those who sow spiritual seeds um, have a right to reap material fruits, so meaning pay or food or lodging or other basic needs while on uh, missionary journeys. And so Paul then explains that though this is his right, he has denied himself of it in this scenario. Um, But he says, you know, apparently in verse 12, when he says, if others share this rightful claim on you, do not we even more, apparently other people were, were... Taking, uh, taking gifts from the Corinthians or taking money or basic food and lodging from the Corinthians while they're preaching the gospel or on missionary journeys. And so he's saying if, if they do, then, then how much more does he as their spiritual father? Um, but he has simply decided not to do that at this time. Then moving down into verses 13 and 14, Paul says, Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings? In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. Um, So Paul brings up two kind of final examples here. First being the Levites. Um, The Levites uh, were employed in the temple service. And so with that, while they were serving in the temple, their lodging and their food was provided for them so that they could be fully dedicated to service of God in the temple. Um, And then furthermore, Paul says that the Lord, and anytime he says the Lord, he's referring to Jesus himself. So he says, Jesus commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. Um, Now, we don't have a a specific, uh, very direct command from Jesus that's been preserved that says, you know, ministers should get paid for preaching the gospel or something like super direct like that. Um, But it's likely that Paul is probably referring to a passage in in Luke chapter 10. Um, And if you scroll to the very bottom of your U version, I just have the the passage there if any of you guys want to reference it later. Um, But it's a a passage where Jesus is is talking to the disciples and about how they will go from town to town and preach the gospel. And he says, "If, if people give you something, you're free to take it from them. And he says a worker is, is worthy of his wages. Um, so it's likely that Paul was referring to that as well. Um, but at this point, so, so Paul, he, he, he uh, says that he has a right to be paid, right? He has a right to receive even just basic food and lodging from the Corinthian church. Um, but he denies it, right? At the end of verse 12, he says, We have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. So you might be wondering, why would Paul deny this right? Um, And how does it promote the gospel anymore? Now, part of this answer is found in our next section, which we'll talk about a little bit, um, where where Paul talks about how it is his joy um, that he is able to preach the gospel free of charge to the Corinthians, um, that it is is something that he is able to boast in. And it's not like, you know, I carry myself higher because I do it for free, but it's something that he he enjoys. He is happy to do it. It's that joy that you have when you, you serve without expecting anything in return. Um, And so Paul says that uh, that there are those reasons, Um, but a a very parallel passage to this one is 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Um, So writing to the same church just a few years later, um, Paul very heavily has to address the issue of his apostolic authority, and he actually has to address the issue of these people who designated themselves as super apostles. And they were saying that Paul was not a true apostle and that they were super apostles, so they were even better than Paul. Um, and they were kind of usurping Paul's power and his authority. And so he had to address this. And uh, part of what he, he said to them was that he said, these people are selfish, greedy men who are out for their own gain. And Paul used his lack of exercising his right to show the Corinthians that his motives for preaching the gospel to them was pure. And, uh, and so in, in that case, it worked out very well for him. Um, Paul also mentions a couple other, in a couple other areas why he uh, at times uh, refused to have pay. Um, and, and in one of those, it was that uh, for, for Corinth, he uh, mentions that he took money from the church in Macedonia. Um, and Macedonia was actually a very poor church community. And so uh, it would have been like taking uh, money from a church in the poorest neighborhood in Missouri and then going to the richest neighborhood in Missouri and, and then like preaching the gospel on, on their dime. Um, and so, but Paul, Paul did that because he wanted to preach the gospel to the Corinthians and he didn't want to be beholden to anybody either. 
Um, and we understand this concept to be true as well. Um, if somebody comes up and gives you a couple thousand dollars, they're just like, hey, just take it. No, no strings attached. Just take the money, right? Um, you know, you could take the money, but there might be a little bit of strings attached, even if it's not like meant to be, right? If that same person calls you up the next day and they're like, hey, I really need help moving like now. Could you just drop everything and please help me? You kind of are obligated to do it, right? Or maybe even something more sinister, and in Paul's case, what he didn't want to happen. Um, and, and as we know uh, from the book of 1 Corinthians so far, he said some pretty scathing things to this church, right? Um, he said some things that would not have settled well, some things that would have been kind of a, a squirm in your seat as you're listening to the letter being read out loud. And so what Paul didn't want to, the situation that he didn't want to be in was for him to say something and, and then people that didn't like it say, hey, um, could you tone it down on that a little bit? And then if he refused, they'll say, well, we're not going to support you anymore. And so then he would be in the choice of, in the choice of do I compromise the, the gospel? Oh, man, was it really that bad? Yes. I was trying to just power through, hoping it was mainly for me. Well, cool, you figured it out. <laughs> so uh, Paul didn't want to be in a choice where he had to, to, uh, to choose between being supported and, and then you know, kind of kicked out and homeless and no way to, to pr pay for his basic needs or compromise the truth of the gospel. And so there are a lot of reasons why Paul decided not to make use of his right to be paid. Um, but, and so he clearly had a lot of different reasons and, and reasons in different scenarios. Um, but even today, there are still good reasons for this. Um, I've known pastors who have, have preached for um, financially struggling churches um, for free, uh, just to keep the church running and going. Um, I've known uh, a lot of my friends have, have gone back to Illinois and preached part-time at a church and worked part-time somewhere else. Um, and I've even known pastors who have done really well financially in, in other areas of life and, and decided to um, work for a church full-time for free. And so there's lots of different uh, scenarios where this still can apply. Um, and, but the, the exception is that for Paul, um, this was, this was his, his, uh, not his obligation to refuse the pay, but it was his, uh, his privilege to do so. And so the, the simple application for this point is, is this. Um, if you're working in ministry, for those of you who may find yourselves working uh, vocationally in ministry um, or for a Christian nonprofit organization, or maybe you're doing IT work for a ministry or something like that, um, you don't have to do it out of the goodness of your heart. The Bible doesn't say that if you're working full time for, um, for a ministry of some sort that you have to do it for free. Um, you, you can get paid. Um, and there are other passages that support this as well. And, and again, with the Luke Luke passage um, down at the bottom of the U version. I, I just put a couple other uh, parallel passage on that topic if you're interested in uh, looking into that. Um, and again, the exception here is that Paul has done this with the church of Corinth um, of his own kind of will and uh, volition, and that uh, he thinks that the transmission of the gospel would not would be possibly hindered if he were to accept payment from uh, the Corinthians. Now, this isn't any different than almost any other missionary that I know of today. Um, if you're a missionary by trade instead of a missionary through your trade, um, what you do is you raise support at a church or your home country, and then you go somewhere else so, so that you can preach the gospel and you can work and do mission work um, full time and without having to worry about working another job and supporting yourself and your family, and also not be a burden on the people that you are uh, that you are ministering to. And so this is exactly what Paul is doing here. He had the money from Macedonia, and they were supporting him in his uh, bringing of the gospel to Corinth. Now, uh, moving on to our second point here, or our second section, is Paul's refusal to exercise his rights, verses 15 through 18. And now, it, it, this is uh, pretty good for me moving into this second section, because if you can believe it, I actually feel a little bit more awkward c coming up here and preaching a passage about how ministers have a right to be paid than I do about any other topic like sex or predestination or any other thing that most people wouldn't want to talk about. So I'll wipe some sweat off my brow and we'll move forward. In this section, uh, we're, we're, we're going to see uh, Paul kind of tie it all back into the fuller context. Um, that includes chapter 8 and some of the previous chapters as well. Um, and so in verse 15, Paul says, But I have made no use of any of these things, or any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any such provision. So there's no ulterior motive here. Paul isn't saying this to, like, guilt trip them into, like, you know, giving them a, a gift or something like that. There's no ulterior motives here. He says, For I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. And so Paul states that he is so convicted by his choice to present the gospel to the Corinthians free of charge that he would rather die than change his practices. 
For everything we know about Paul, he was a pretty stubborn dude. I mean, if he would rather die than do it, he would actually probably die um, than change his practice. In verse 16, he says, For if I preach the gospel, that, get, that gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. So Paul here is stating that, that this is kind of his one ground for boasting. His one thing that he can take pride in, that he can uh, take joy in, is preaching the gospel to the Corinthians free of charge, not burdening them while he's there, not having to stay in somebody's house and them having to cook for him and all of these things that would have gone with that. And then he says that he is compelled to preach the good news of Jesus Christ as well. Um, Charles Swindle, who's, who's really one of the great kind of pastors and commentators of our generation, if you listen to uh, any uh, Christian radio, you'll, you'll hear him on there every once in a while. Um, he was quoted uh, as, as saying something uh, that was really in reference to this. Um, when a young man was asking him uh, if, if he should go into vocational ministry or not, um, and Charles Swindle said, quote, if you can imagine yourself being content doing anything else, do that instead. And really what Charles is, is saying is, is the same thing that Paul is saying here. Paul would not be content doing anything except preaching the gospel. He says, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. Paul could not imagine doing any other thing except for preach the gospel. He could not he could not be content doing any other trade, doing any other thing. He is compelled to tell people about how Jesus died on the cross for our sins, how he resurrected again, and that we can resurrect with him in, in, and share in that resurrection. In verse 17, Paul says, For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward, but if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. Um, so Paul's wording here is a little bit strange, but I think what he's communicating here is that he deserves no reward for preaching the gospel because he's only doing what he should, right? He says, for, I do this of, I, for if I do this of my own will, I have a reward, but if not of my own will, I am entrusted with a stewardship. So Paul is referring back to the fact uh, that he was commissioned by Jesus Christ himself to preach the gospel. He was entrusted with a stewardship, in verse 18, he says, What then is my reward, that in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel? Leon Morris, a, a really great commentator, uh, explains verse 18 this way in kind of a summary of this section. He says, Paul had to preach, but he did not have to do it for free of charge. He simply did not see it, this as a good strategy. He has already said in verse 15 that it is his boast, something he delights in. Now he says it is his reward. His pay is to serve without pay. Preaching without pay is his privilege. The gospel gave him his rights, but he chose not to use them. And for us today, this, this principle is the same. It's that sometimes love compels us to lay down our rights. We heard from, from Chris, he gave a great message on, on, on 1 Corinthians chapter 8 a couple weeks ago. Um, and, and, and Paul had stated uh, that he would never eat meat again if it caused one of his brothers or sisters in Christ to stumble. Um, so he's laying down his freedoms for the sake of of other believers. And in the same way here, Paul is saying he's laying down his freedoms, he's laying down his rights because love compels him to do so. And so Paul ends this section really in the same way that he ended chapter 8. Um, he says that he has actually surrendered his rights so that the gospel could advance unhindered and that he will continue to do so, not out of obligation, but out of privilege. You see, Paul understood that love compels us to lay down our rights. And this overall principle goes back to the overarching principle stated, um, well, actually, it would have been in the video tonight. kind of thought we did it anyways. We didn't. Um, it would have been in the video tonight. This overarching principle of uh, laying down our rights or our freedoms, which includes time and money and actions. And those things are motivated first by our love for God, and then secondarily by our love for people. And interestingly enough, when Paul deals with this issue again in 2 Corinthians, um, in 2 Corinthians 11.11, 11, he, he says in reference to why he did not accept money to them, he says, is it because I do not love you? He said, God knows I do. And so he's saying, I love you, and that's why I didn't accept money from you, because I felt like the gospel would be, uh, would be best presented without accepting money from you. And so what's so interesting about this passage's connection to chapter 8 and the passage that we're in tonight is that the motivation is the same. When laying down a right or a freedom for the sake of the gospel or for the sake of our brothers and sisters in Christ, it is out of love because love compels us to lay down our rights. Now, how does this apply to us today? Um, this, this statement is kind of general, and again, it covers a lot, a, a couple different chapters here. Um, 
And so there's a lot of different ways that this can be applied. And, and, and Chris gave us some very good examples in his sermon a couple weeks ago. Um, but one, here's one simple area of application that I think we can apply this to. Um, lay down your rights and serve. So the area of service. And, and, and so this, this idea of love compelling us to lay down our rights. Our laying down of our rights sometimes uh, looks like a laying down of our time, our money, our actions, and, and anything else. And so for me, uh, personally, sometimes what this looks like um, is, is doing service work as a Christian, not as a paid minister, right? And so this may look like serving uh, on my own time when I would normally like be home or fishing or doing bills or something like that. Um, but serving on my own time and dime, not the ministry's time and dime, right? Laying down my own personal time. And for you guys, this, this really looks, looks very similar as well. Uh, it might look like serving in this ministry, uh, a church here in Rala, your home church, at a camp uh, that, that, that for, the, uh, for, for the summer. Um, it may look like uh, lay, uh, laying aside a, a, an opportunity at a high-paying internship to work at a Christian camp over the summer. We've had a lot of good ones come here and, and uh, present to us at Catalyst this, this semester. And so there's a lot of different ways that we can lay down our rights out of love for Christ and love for other believers in Christ. And so my application and challenge for you guys tonight based on this section is, is very simple. Find one way that you can lay down your freedoms and serve. One, one, one thing. Think of it right now. Commit to it and then follow through. Whether that's as big as, as you know, not, not uh, pursuing an, an internship as hard as you would and instead serving at a Christian camp for the summer, um, or, or as small as, as committing to doing one sort of active service or participating in a service project before the semester's over, even though it's going to be you know, a tough no next couple of weeks. But whatever that ends up being, I want you guys to, to think of one thing that you can do and then do it. Because when we talk about this idea of love compelling us to lay down our rights, we see that Paul did it, but um, the perfect example is Jesus. Jesus laid down everything. I mean, he gave up his, his supremeness as, as the supreme being of all eternity past, all eternity future in heaven to come down to earth and, and be a human, be a baby, not much less. And, uh, and he, he, wasn't, uh, he wasn't even uh, demanding to, to live as a king while he was here on earth. He was born into poverty. And so because of love, Christ laid down all of these things for us. Paul laid down some of his rights for the promotion of the gospel. And so we need to start figuring out some ways that we can lay down our rights and our desires for the sake of the gospel as well, because love compels us to lay down our rights. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we come to you now, Lord, and we thank you so much for your word. God, we thank you for uh, putting so much of your, 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 making so much of your word accessible to us. We thank you for revealing so much of who you are um, to us so that we can know how to be better like you and that we can know you better. God, I pray that as we finish up this semester that, that we would look for ways to serve you, that we would look for ways to lay aside our, our freedoms or our rights or our time or our money to serve you because of how much we love you, because of how much we love other people. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.